Well, welcome back to the next podcast in the Super Energy series. <clears throat> this is chapter two of Super Energy. And if my memory serves me well, it's podcast four. Chapter two, Super Energy. Spiritual and supernormal phenomena are implicit in yoga and can be explained in a scientific context if allowance is made in physics for energy existing beyond the speed of light. In his theory of relativity, Einstein established the importance of the speed of light in our world. He said that mass, space and time are relative to the invariable speed of light measured at nearly 300 million meters per second. In his equation, E equals mc squared, Einstein revealed that mass is relative to the speed of light. Now this is easy to understand if we view subatomic particles as whirlpools of light rather than balls of material stuff. He then went on to declare that the speed of light is the sole universal constant. But he may have been wrong in that assumption. It may be that speed of light measured by scientists happens to be the intrinsic speed of the energy that makes up our world in this part of the universe. In other parts of the universe, there could be worlds made up of energy with different speeds. This is possible in the quantum vortex theory. The quantum vortex theory is based on the assumption that everything in our world is formed of particles of movement at the speed of light in the form of a vortex or a wave. This is why the laws of physics are relative to the speed of light. If that is so, there could be other worlds based on speeds of energy faster than the speed of light, spinning in vortices or vibrating in waves. And the laws of physics pertaining to these worlds would be relative to the higher speeds of their energy. The idea that energy could exist with speeds faster than that of common light may have appear to contradict Einstein's theory of relativity. Relativity theory makes it clear that particles, as particles accelerate, they don't exceed the speed of light, represented by the symbol C, they just become more massive. This is borne out by experiment. When particles are accelerated in high energy laboratories, they never move faster than the speed of light. They simply become increasingly massive and as their mass increases exponentially as their velocity approaches that of light. However, this restraint is based on the materialist idea that the speed is a property of a material entity. If speed is a property of the energy forming entities, then theoretically it is possible that the energy spinning within a quantum vortex could possess a speed faster than the common speed of light. The super energy hypothesis is based on the possibility that there could be worlds made up of energy spinning in vortices or vi vibrating in waves faster than the speed of light. And there would be no reason to suppose that the laws of physics in these worlds would be different to the laws of physics that underpin our world. So I'll just reiterate this to make it clear. What physics shows is the, that a particle, a subatomic particle of matter, cannot move faster than the speed of light. But if that particle is a vortex of energy, there is no reason why the energy forming that vortex particle could not exist within that particle at speeds beyond the speed of light. So that's the difference. And I'm not presuming that this idea I've got is right. I'm simply using this idea that I'm developing of energy existing beyond the speed of light, fast, with faster speeds than the speed of light, which I call super energy. That that presumption, that idea can explain the whole spectrum of supernatural and spiritual phenomena.
So that's the key. It's, it's, it enables us, this is the, the role of science, is to help us understand what's going on in the world, not to explain everything away when there's overwhelming evidence for the existence of non-material realities. So I'll repeat that last paragraph. The superenergy hypothesis is based on the possibility that there could be worlds made up of energy spinning in vortices or vibrating in waves faster than the speed of light and that there would be no reason to suppose the laws of physics in these worlds would be different to the laws of physics that underpin our world. If that were so, the only difference between these worlds and our own would be the speed of the light whirling or undulating in the quantum vortices or waves that make them up. The speed of the energy underpinning each world would be its constant of relativity. I call these the Einstein constants after Albert Einstein. The superenergy hypothesis is an axiom that is not proved by scientific experiment. It is invented. This is fine because it is the start point of the superenergy theory and as Einstein said, the axioms of a scientific theory cannot be drawn from experiment. They must be freely invented. Superenergy may be just a theory, but theories in science are useful if they help us make sense of evidence. The material hypothesis fails in the face of NDEs or near-death experiences. But the theory of superenergy can help us build a theoretical framework to account for life after death from the evidence of NDEs. To be acceptable in science, a novel thesis must be reasonable and make sense of evidence that cannot otherwise be understood. This postulate that superenergy exists in vortices and waves to form worlds beyond the speed of light that are just like our own and are governed by the same laws of physics concurs with the NDE reports that after people die, they find themselves in a world very similar to our own. So you can see it. I'm, the idea I've got that there could be wor worlds in which the speed of the energy in vortices and waves and atoms making molecules and crystals and worlds just like our own, that the laws of physics are the, the, the same, that there's no difference in, between these worlds and our own worlds. except the speed of the energy within the subatomic particles and waves, quantum waves. That's a presumption, but it explains why it is that when people die, they find themselves in a world just like our own. I mean, I'm sitting in a field of grass. And one of the things people speak about in NDEs is that they find themselves in a field of grass. So there's grass up there, just like there is down here. And they find themselves in a body up there, just like they have a body down here. And that would require that all the laws of physics are exactly the same in the higher worlds as they are in our world. It's not that we can prove this to be absolutely true, but it just makes sense of what People are experiencing an out-of-body and near-death experiences. Many people imagine that if we go to another world after death, it would be ethereal. However, in near-death experiences, people report that the other world they visit is as real and seemingly substantial as our own. Substantiality is a subjective experience. Our perception of substantiality is due in part to the inertia of mass, which is a consequence of the spin in the quantum vortex of energy. It is also the way we experience atomic and molecular bonding. Bonding forces in atoms and molecules are properties of the vortex of energy, which are explained in the quantum vortex in terms of vortex interactions. 
substantiality could be perceived in the superenergy worlds. If superenergy spins to form subatomic particles of matter and vibrates in waves to form photons of light, spinning and vibrating superenergy could set up atoms, molecules, and life forms in worlds full of light, just like our own. Sentient beings could live in bodies just like ours in these worlds and experience reality through them just as we do. Certainly this is what the NDE evidence suggests. <coughs> Thinking about super energy in this way could help us incorporate the supernatural in the scientific frame of understanding. People embedded in a materialistic worldview might not be excited by this, but others who are more spiritually inclined may be enthralled by the arrival of a world view grounded in science that allows for higher dimensions of reality. Because of the bias toward materialism in science, most information about higher dimensions comes from sources outside of science, such as the Urantia book, which provides useful pointers in our line of inquiry. According to the Urantia book, there are other worlds based on higher speeds of light and there is a world immediately beyond our own of which ours is but a part. It is governed by an Einstein constant approximately twice the speed of light. I call this world the hyperphysical plane of reality. Formed of hyperphysical energy, it would correspond to the fourth dimension in common parlance. I believe it is the hyperphysical plane of reality that people visit when they have a near-death experiences and where people go after physical death. The hyperphysical plane associated with the earth could correspond to the anima mundi. According to esoteric literature, it seems that for the most part, people do not leave the earth after death, but go to rest in a higher level of reality associated with the planet, which is known as the anima mundi. Anima means spirited, or animated, and mundi means the earth. So it's like the spiritual earth, or the soul earth. People reside there between lives, and from there they may reincarnate for a new life, in a fresh body, on the physical plane of the earth, which is formed of physical energy. The idea that we incarnate from a hyperphysical plane of reality would make sense of the animating principle known to Plato as the psyche, Plato taught that a psyche, otherwise known as a soul, comes into incarnation at conception and departs at death. Plato's teaching of the psyche is supported by NDE evidence of human cognition surviving death of the physical body. So again, near-death experiences support the idea of the soul, which Democritus repudiated but which Plato upheld, we call the psyche. So again, due to the evidence of near-death experiences that are now incorporated in the body of science, there's so much evidence. And all the explain-aways of hallucinations of dying brains have been explained away by the scientists. And once a paper is published in a reputable journal, like the Annals of the New York Academy of Science, Sciences, and is backed by scientists from all over the, the Western world, from reputable in universities, like London University and Harvard University and the University of California and New York, then the subject of that paper is part of the body of science, and you can believe in it. You don't have to be unscientific to believe in the soul anymore. In fact, it was the, the man who founded materialism, Democritus, two and a half thousand years ago, who's revered by scientists. It's his philosophy of materialism that has been repudiated and proved to be wrong.
According to the Urantia book, there are worlds beyond the hyperphysical level of reality which are governed by Einstein constants considerably higher than the speed of light. I call these levels of super energy the superphysical planes of reality, the lowest of which corresponds to the fifth dimension in common parlance. In the Urantia book, it says that the fifth dimensional level is governed by an Einstein constant of approximately 16 times the speed of light. According to the Urantia book, there are planes of reality beyond the fifth dimension based on even higher speeds of energy. These higher planes of reality are not restricted to the Earth, but are associated with deep space, predominating the universe at large. Many people believe in spiritual dimensions where souls go after exceptional incarnations on Earth. The science of super energy supports the ideas of spirits and higher dimensions of reality. These living forms of super physical energy could correspond to the angels and the gods spoken of in religion and ancient traditions. Super physical beings could also be the spirits that incarnate as human beings. I believe a psyche or soul is a spirit that reincarnates many times, leaving bodies of memory in the anima mundi of the earth, somewhat like video data stored in the hard drive of a computer that can be accessed any time. Some people describe these lifetime soul memories as soul fragments. I call them soul bodies. I cannot prove the existence of the psyche, spirits or souls. I am not concerned to convince anyone of the existence of the hyperphysical or superphysical dimensions. My endeavour is to make sense of traditional spiritual knowledge in terms of the superenergy model in the light of the accumulating evidence of near or after-death experiences, reincarnation and out-of-body experiences. Many people who have had an NDE report that the world they visited was occupied by deceased relatives and friends in recognisable bodies. Recognisable relatives could be accounted for by suggesting we grow a super energy body in precise parallel to the physical body, which separates from the physical body when it dies, much like a snake shedding its skin. The super body, corresponding to the soul body, or soul fragment, could then go off into the world to which it belongs. Suggesting we grow a super energy, super body in parallel to the physical body could also help to explain the two body dilemma some people have during a near death or an out of body experience when they find they are still in a body after they have died. The super energy model allows for the possibility that we could be living simultaneously in parallel bodies, in the physical and the hyperphysical dimensions of reality. This premise of parallel bodies can help people who have had an NDE to understand how they could be alive and still in a body while looking down on their lifeless body. This situation was described by an American professor of art, Howard Storm. In his book, My Descent Into Death, Howard Storm tells how he found himself in a body with heightened faculties of perception, looking down on a body identical to himself, lying on the hospital bed where he had been moments before. This was a very bewildering experience for him, as it is for many other people having similar experiences. The fact that Howard Storm's new body was identical to his dead physical body suggests his physical body may have acted as scaffolding for his superphysical body. In his NDE experience, Storm found himself in hell. The description of his life before he died suggests his physical life may have determined not only the form of his super energy body, but also its fate. NDEs report dark experiences as well as the light. Fortunately, they are rare, but they do raise questions. They do raise concerns as well as questions. 
How is it possible for us to have two bodies existing simultaneously? How can they be exactly identical, atom for atom, molecule for molecule, and cell for cell? Is one physical and the other hyperphysical? If so, does the hyperphysical superbody co correspond to the platonic psyche or soul that is believed to overlay the physical body during physical life and separate from it at death? Does it correspond to a ghost? Answers to some of these questions can be derived from a principle that I call the principle of coincidence. According to the quantum vortex theory, the quantum vortex of energy sets up space and time on our plane of existence. If there are multiple planes, space-time could be set up by vortex motion on each plane. If space-time is set up by the quantum vortex on each plane, it could not exist between the planes. If the physical, hyperphysical and superphysical planes of reality are not separated by space or time, they could be separated by the intrinsic speeds of their energy, their Einstein constants. If the energy planes are separated by speed and not by space-time, they could coincide. That is, they could exist simultaneously in the same here and now. Sheets of paper impaled on a spike depict the coincident planes of reality. Spiritual law has it that there are angels all around us, but we are not aware of them because they're moving too fast. And we don't see the fairies either because, they are, because we are too slow and clumsy. People in times gone by believed we are surrounded by spiritual beings that are coincident with us. They live in a parallel world, but we are not aware of them because we are separated from them by a factor of speed. So I'll repeat that. Spiritual law has it that there are angels all around us, but we are not aware of them because they are moving too fast. And we don't see the fairies either because we are too slow and clumsy. You know, people dismiss angels and even more so fairies. And they think that, you know, anyone, you know, the scientific people think that anyone who still believes in angels and fairies are, are idiots, uneducated, low IQs, you know. But it, isn't it interesting that these people who, you know, from the past who've been dismissed as ignoramuses, recognize that the separation between ourselves and the spirits is a factor of speed. This idea that we are separated by frequency of vibration is pseudoscience, it's just a, a metaphor. But the angels, the ancients were right, recognizing its speed that separates the worlds. Maybe they weren't so ignorant after all. It's a bit like this whole idea that particles of energy are more like thoughts than things, that they're more like particles of dream stuff. That maybe we're living in a dream. Maybe we wake up from this dream state into another dream state. And it's very interesting when people come back from a near-death experience, they often report that their memory of this world just fades away, as though they've woken up from a dream. So, you know, the Aboriginals who, uh, you know, the, the First Nation Australians, who are running around without clothes and, and shoes, dismissed as savages by the Europeans when they arrived. <laughs> they anticipated this new quantum understanding of our universe. They were way ahead of us in their understanding that we live in dream states. Some people catch a glimpse of a hyperphysical body as a ghost. Children and sensitive people claim to see fairies or angels, but most people don't see spiritual entities in higher dimensions. Why is this so? 
the answer could be in another principle called the principle of energy speed subsets. It is self-evident that slow speeds are a subset or a part of fast speeds, i.e. bicycle speed is a subset of the speeds available to a car. A car can move at bicycle speeds, but no matter how hard you pedal on your bike, you won't catch an accelerating car. The principle of energy speed subsets based on the law that slow speeds are a subset or a part of faster speeds suggests that worlds based on lower speeds of energy are a part of worlds based on higher speeds. That infers a nested relationship between the planes of energy. Like nested Russian dolls, the physical world could be nested in the hyperphysical world, which in turn would be nested in the superphysical. This arrangement of superimposed worlds of energy with each world based on a lower energy speed nested in the worlds based on higher speeds of energy can also be depicted as concentric spheres. So I'll just show you the pictures in the book that the best model for the arrangement of the worlds is the nested Russian dolls, with our physical world being the smallest little doll and the next one out is the hyperphysical, and the next one out is the lowest level of the superphysical, and so on and so forth. And the other diagram, of course, is this lower diagram on the page, which is the concentric sphere diagram, which shows that the innermost level is the physical level, and then the next level is the hyperphysical, and beyond that the superphysical, as concentric spheres. And this represents the harmony of the spheres. Now, people often ask me, is there a world based on lower speeds than the speed of light? And what I say, if there is such a world, it is part of our reality, because all speeds between zero and the speed of light belong to the physical plane of reality. And all speeds between zero and twice the speed of light belong to a hyperphysical, which means that our world is part of the next world. And then the superphysical contains the other two. So we are spirits with a soul and a body. We're not bodies with a soul and a spirit. Okay, so the spiritual level of us rep is represented by the outermost sphere there, which is the superphysical. The soul part of us is represented by the hyperphysical, and then the physical body is rep represented by the innermost sphere, which is the physical body. The physical world, based on the speed of light, is depicted by the central sphere. The hyperphysical world is represented by the second sphere, and the superphysical corresponds to the third sphere out. This concentric model, this concentric sphere model of the physical, hyperphysical, and superphysical levels of reality, corresponds to the Pythagorean harmony of spheres. The harmony of spheres depicts the planes of energy where the laws of physics are the same, but only the intrinsic speeds of energy, the Einstein constants of relativity, differ. In the Vortex Key to Future Science, my co-author Peter Hewitt proposed a matchbox analogy to illustrate the superimposed nested relationship of the worlds. He suggested did we depict the physical world as a matchbox and imagine the matches in the matchbox as people that are only aware of the world inside the matchbox. They're not aware of the room outside of the matchbox, but the folk in the room are aware of them. In this analogy, the room represents the hyperphysical level of reality, which in turn is part of a house depicting the superphysical levels of reality. Now, you cannot fit a room into a matchbox and you cannot fit a house into a room. So it is that movements with speed beyond the speed of light cannot be contained within the physical space and time continuum relative to the speed of light. The perception of supernatural phenomena is limited by the principle of energy speed subsets. A supernatural or super energy being could be in your presence, but with your physical sight you would not see it. This is because physical energy does not interact with super energy. 
Super energy exists outside of physical space and time. So photons of physical light would not reflect off the super energy being. Physical light would pass right through it, which is why it would be invisible to you. But it could see you because its super energy light would reflect off you. This is because you and everything in your environment would be part of its space-time continuum. <clears throat> Th these descriptions of coincident levels of non-substantial reality fit closely with the First Nation Australian description of dream states. Living close to nature, maybe they could see the nature of reality in a way that we in the civilised West cannot. The Western idea that seeing is believing may place a serious limitation on our perception of reality if our perception is limited by our civilised way of living. Things could be going on all around us which we cannot see because our senses have been dulled by the materialistic way of life. People living close to nature may have more highly attuned senses required for survival in the wild. People who work on themselves or are naturally gifted to be more sensitive to coincident realities may also perceive energies and entities most of us are unaware of. The flat earth mentality of die-hard physicalists in materialistic civilization can cause them to distress when they die, totally unprepared for their departure into another level of reality. They may find themselves standing in a hyperphysical body, unable to communicate to a relative sitting by their empty physical shell, that they are no longer in pain, sick or dying. Professor Howard Storm was a typical physicalist. He experienced this when he died. Before I read Howard Storm's experience, which concludes this chapter, I would just like to say, some of you listening may have a question in your mind, well, how, how do people in the physical world see a ghost? Well, I explain that later on. It, what I explain is that it seems as though the physical body, especially the physical brain, is a reducer of our experience. It dulls things down. It seems to limit the ability to which our hyperphysical self, which is the true self, can perceive reality. And this is spoken of by Aldous Huxley in Doors of Perception, of where, you know, we're limited by our brains in our ability to see the universe at large. And it could be that these chemical filters, these chemical suppressors of our appreciation of reality, necessary for our survival in this world, because it's a harsh, hard physical world. And if we're going around in a mimsy sort of talking to the fauns and the fairies, we might be eaten by a saber-toothed tiger. So in our evolution, we may have dulled down our perception of other levels of reality so that we could be more conscious of the dangers lurking in this level of reality. And as I go on through this book, I will be explaining how it is that people perceive psychic phenomena, how they perceive other realities whilst they're alive in this physical world. So if you just bear with me as I go on reading. So what I'm going to do is just conclude this podcast with the final paragraph in this chapter too. In 1985, Howard Storm was in a hospital bed in Paris following a perforated duodenal ulcer. As described in my descent into death, an operation should have been performed within five hours. But it was a weekend and the hospital had only skeletal staff, so he was left for ten hours before surgery. Howard was in terrible pain with only his wife Beverly by his bedside to comfort him. Suddenly he found himself pain-free standing by his bed. He said the floor was cool beneath his feet, the light was bright and everything in the room was crystal clear. He was wide awake and not dreaming. Hospital smells assailed his nose. All his senses were heightened and alert. He clenched his fists to prove he was awake and not dreaming. He was aware of blood coursing through his body and the beat of his heart was pounding in his ears. He was very anxious and his mind was racing, but he felt more alive than he had ever felt before. He spoke to Beverly, but she didn't react. 
He shouted at her, but she still didn't respond. Then he noticed a lifeless body on his bed under the sheet and was surprised at its resemblance to his own. It couldn't have been him because he was standing over it looking down at it. Storm's initial reaction was annoyance that someone had played a nasty trick and placed a wax model of him in the bed where he had been lying so ill and so in, in so much pain only moments before. He was very confused and leaning down to his wife he screamed at her until spittle was flying in her face. But she continued to ignore him. She just sat in her chair, weeping in despair. So thank you for your patience and for your attention to this podcast. And um, I hope you'll join me on the next podcast, where, which is chapter three, which deals with near-death experiences. Thank you very much for listening.